How was your week? <laughs> Being very random, I know. Right? It's been uh, it's been two weeks since last time we met. Um, how's like you know before we start like you know anything to share since last week? It has to be it can be Buddhism if you're comfortable. It can be anything because Buddhism does not live our life, right? Um, How was your week? How was my week? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I know what you feel now. <laughs> Dylan, how do you start a, 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 top, a, a session like this? But um, yes, uh, the week has been hectic. The week has been non-stop, like a Sydney train, which never come true sometimes. It's always late. And, uh, but, but it's very good for me because I'm the kind of person who needs to move all the time. As you can see, um, and and you know this helps me to settle down. You know, have have this structured session, and I'm learning from you guys as we share in the session together. Uh, but yeah, I've been attending this class, that class, nonstop, and I realize I need to concentrate on what's matter. This matters. Um, my job matters because I need to eat, and. Currently, my acting class matters because it helps me to put two, the two together. But let's go back to Buddhist, Buddha's story. Um, have you guys heard, you know, when Buddha was born? I know, why, how do you go into here? So we're going back to the main story today. And before we begin, we should chant, I forgot about one thing. We should chant 10 times the name of our original teacher, Shaimuni Buddha. Um, Chinese or Sanskrit? We do Chinese. Namo Ben Shi Shi Jia Mo Ni Fo. Namo Ben Shi Shi Jia Mo Ni Fo. Namo Ben Shi Shi Jia Mo Ni Fo. Nam, okay, we'll use Sanskrit as well. Namo Shayamuni Buddha. Namo Shayamuni Buddha. Namo Shayamuni Buddha. So today, I would like to add two amendments to what we learned last two weeks, uh, two weeks ago. First amendment is the birth of the Buddha. One of the birth of the Buddha uh, that I forgot to mention, which is very important, is when he was born from his from the the the, the, the mother of the Buddha. He walked seven steps in Lumbini Garden, and every step followed by the lotus, as a lotus cushioning him. And in the end of the seven steps, his arm is pointing, one arm pointing to heaven, one arm pointing to the ground. And he says, the above heaven, on the end and underneath the heavens, only I am the most worthy one. Tianxiang Tianxia Wei Wo Du Zun. I'm the most worthy one, above heaven and under heaven. What do you feel when you hear that? Be honest. One word to describe. It's okay. Without context. Um, a little bit <laughs> Good. Anything? Can yeah, be honest as well. Yeah, arrogant, right? High, high and mighty. Whoa, whoa, man, like what? You're the most worthy one. You're the most, uh, how to say, noble one, that's it. No one else. But if we think about the Buddha as a person, you know, a person who is um, very kind towards, you know, less advantage and lower caste people, as, as you can see in the later life, it's not making sense. Right? It usually fits an egoistical person, narcissistic, but he's very far from it. So why, why did he say that? Do you guys have any theory about it? Why did he say that? Because he's referring to the real nature of us. We are all Beautiful. So I means the real nature. Yeah. So the I is not me, Shaimuni Buddha, or whatever form I'm presenting to you. What he represents before he becomes Buddha is 
you know, the most perfect, like the one I mentioned in the chat, the most beautiful, most, how to say, most genuine, most beautiful, and um, most kind part of yourself. That part of yourself is the most worthy in everything, even above of heaven and earth. Not none of the gods in your you know Greek mythologies or anything, all these Avengers superpower, it has nothing compared to your purest part in yourself. That is your most beautiful, most truest, most kind part of your heart. That is the most worthy one. And he arrived in this world showing you a performance because he wanted to inspire you that you can be that person as well. Not because I am your Lord, I'm overlording you. That is not how Buddhism works. We do not work like that. It's all inspiration, it's all education, and, and that's it. Um, so he finished that sentence, and then you know everyone's like, this is a very rare uh, mark of a sage. And, and now we understand that your, your Buddha nature is the most worthy one. Another amendment is the taking alms. I'm skipping far ahead when he become a monk. Do you know um, in China, they don't do alms? It's a symbolic stuff rather than an actual practice as they did in Theravada tradition. In Mahayana tradition, you rarely see them doing the arm taking. There are some of it still going there, but do you know why when Buddha, Buddhism you know, arrived in China and then Japan, Korea and Vietnam, why did they stop doing the arm taking? Geographical and cultural. Geographical is colder and their clothing they can't um, wear too bad for men, for the monk. They, they don't have the, you know, Theravada one day will show the left arms bad as a male, uh, um, uh, as a monk. But in China, imagine you do that in Harbin, in the northeast China, mm-hmm. or in Beijing weather, because a lot of imperial palaces are there and a lot of monks are there. You will would, you would literally freeze to death. So he has to wear double layer, and triple layer. As you can see, Master Ching Kong is wearing. Another thing about alms is in China, apparently, the, um, the, 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 the tradition is a bit different. The way they, they see it is monk was introduced into China at the invitation of the king, of the emperor, and or you know the president of the country. If a president of a country are giving a title to this teacher, monk, as the teacher of the kings. Can you imagine a teacher of the king going out on the street and asking for food? What would that reflect on the imperial family? Like what? Are you starving your own teacher? And obviously in that cultural context, they were like, no, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to let you take care of the land tax-free. So there's no ATO or anything on that or CTO. Um, sorry, <laughs> China tax office. Imperial China Tax Office, 2,000 years ago. Anyway, there's no tax, all right? there's no accountant, nothing. They just need to do their job as a monk, teach, propagate. And hence, they don't need to ask for arms because they have a patch of land they can grow on, and which is why the tradition slightly altered. I'll get into that much later uh, after we finish the Buddha's saga. And that's it. That's the two amendments I have. Uh, let me go Thank you for correcting me. As you see, I pick from my memory pieces, and um, sometimes I string them and I miss one or two beats. But I will do my best. Okay. Um, so where were we last time? So Buddha was born. The sage predicted he either be a monarch, universal monarch, that can take care of the whole world, actually, by virtue. That means he, he, he will not resort to swords or violence as much as he can. He will be able to take over the world just by his virtue without needing resorting to violence. Whether it's realistic or not, we'll leave it to that because it hasn't, it hasn't happened in our current society, in, in our history so far. But remember, we only have written records about 5,000 years. It's nothing compared to what might come before that. So we need to open 
the possibility of this happening in the past, past civilization. Whether it's there or not, leave it to speculation. But what we know in Buddhist tradition is we do have universal monarch. And universal monarch goes in three grades. One is the, they go by the metal purity. Copper, John Nusen Wang, Jing Nusen Wang. I think, I think copper is the lowest, uh, is the first rank, and then the highest would be gold, I think. Copper, silver, gold, something like that. And each of them has a bigger realm to control. They will take care of even bigger, solar system, stuff like that. And what I mentioned about chakra vati, right? Chakra is will, John Will. Alright? Vati, maybe is a, a, a king. So chakra, if you think about chakra, what does UFO look like? So, so Master Ching does indulge a little bit because people ask that question. So I was like, this is something interesting. Who knows, you know, they might be the Chakravati sending one of his envoy in UFO. I also leave it to that, you know, to your imagination. But in the Buddhist tradition, they do have a, 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 a record, you know, that how do they exercise their rule? And then Australia exercise their rule by the power of British colonization of, you know, a, a railway, power of railway, able to transport his troops everywhere across the world. All right, that's how they conquer the country. So the China, back in the Imperial China, if you want to take care of uh, the Imperial China, you need to take care, sorry man, I really like that part. They will take care of the, the Yellow River, they need to take care of the, the Central Plain, enough to feed the people. Only then they stretch out southwards and northwest. So they need to take care of that beautiful part, the Shanghai, the Beijing area. Those are fertile. So Chakravati as well. How did he do that without transportation? And in this in the scripture, it did mention um, the way they exercise the rules. They rode on a vehicle that looks like a wheel, an obelisk disc shaped wheel. So it might be UFO, might be not. And there's a lot of report about that. No, I'm not indulging too much in that. I'm just telling you that there's so much more interesting stuff you can find in Buddha Sutra that you can neither confirm nor deny because you can't see it. All right, the one you can confirm for sure it is teaching us about morality, it's teaching us about more virtue. That is what matters. All right, but I don't want to make it too dry. Just telling you out there how these people reach this level of merits, this level of power, is not by conquering, murdering taking over other people's stuff. Those are just phenomena. It's just surface. What actually they did is they cultivate deep merits, five precepts. Buddha teach that. He knows his audience, not, not all always say, I want to be fully enlightened and I want to be Buddha, I want to go out six realms. They know some of them want to be rich. Some of them want to be powerful. Some of them want to have a happy life as a human, a family. Obviously, I do encourage everyone those things are not lasting forever. That's what he encouraged. But if you want, he will give you. Ask and ye shall receive. Same thing in Buddhism. And so he teaches us about the karma, the, f the flower and the fruit, and how you do it in order to achieve this stage by stage that you result a desire at this stage. Right? You desire um, growth in your career. So you need to start by working on not just your skill, your virtue, the five precepts. No killing, no stealing, no... Um, sexual misconduct, no, um, no lying, including harsh words, divisive, divisive words, um, lying, big lie, small lies. You know, big lie, I'm a Buddha. Oh, I attain Buddhahood. That's big lie. Small lie, white, white lies is somehow in there, but depends on the context. And the last one is the no intoxicants. So the five percent. I'm not. I will go deep later. For now, just give you a map. Now back to Buddha himself, when he, was a, when he was growing up to be a very dashing, good-looking young man, and he was in his kingdom, palace, he was not allowed to exit any time during his childhood because his father, knowing that he either be the Chakravati, the monarch, that he wished him to go, or he will be a monk, uh, he will be a monk, he will attain the supreme enlightenment which we now call Buddha. So, spoiler alert, he chose the later. Um, and his father is like, 
You know, if you're the parents, right, at the age of 45, you get one children, and you have a huge corporation behind you. You want to hand it over to him, right? Or from his perspective, of course I want to hand over all my empire to him. Why would I want my son to go to a path where he's, you know, either shelterless, uh, have the back food every day, have to wear leftover clothes? And we're using the common sense. Then we're like, no. But Buddha has his own path to walk. He, Shaim, Prince Siddhartha has his own path to go. He's not here to enjoy. He's here to show. So, let's get back to the history part. So he was there, and his father was like giving him all he needs, all the knowledge, all the you know, games, anything he needs to have a good life. It's there. He has three palaces just for him. His own enjoyment. So you have a house in Bondi, you have another one in North Shore, and then you have another one in 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 um I say in, in Melbourne, in a prime estate. Think of that. Anytime you want to go, they will have a special chauffeur sending you to the private airport and the jet send you straight there. But they don't allow you to walk into the common street uh, suburbs because something might happen, stabbings or some terrible homeless. So your father wants to shoot you from this. Imagine that. Right? You only can go to the best place offer in this country. So that's what happened to him. He's trapped in that rich, luxurious area, enjoying omakase or any top level food. Why am I taking off omakase? Because I'm going to Japan. <laughs> anyway, so going back to the point, he is very rich, living luxuriously, but he read a lot. Has one thing about knowledge is he cannot contain it in the world. He's, he also, Master Ching Kong say, represents intellectuals. He shows himself as an intellectual. He needs to know what is going on outside the world. Right? Why, you know, the books talk about life and death, books talk about a lot of situations, society stuff. In the book, it says so. He was not allowed outside the palace pool. So he needs to know. So he asks his father, can I go out, please? And his father's like, no, you have all you need here. Why do you need to go out, son? And he's like, how do I suppose, how am I supposed to rule over this kingdom if I'm not aware of what's happening in my realm? You know? And his father's like, fine, you got a point. So he knows, he knows his father wants him to be a monarch. So he say that. So like, and then, so he opened up the door and in the history, they are very famous. The Si Mian Men, I think San Mian has Si Mian. I think there's um, four gates in his palace facing one of the directions. And it's a symbolism. And every time he went out, his father already planned everything out. Like imagine he cleared up the whole streets of um, you know, Winyard Station with homeless people with shoe away, only the most luxurious, richest people. Uh, they need to show on the bustling and hustling all this good part of his country. And all these poor people, sick people, uh, old people um, are not allowed to be in the site. And the monk are not allowed to be in the site of the prince. But he's only a human. You know, King Sodana, the father of Buddha, is only a human, not a god, not heavenly beings. And so what happened is when he go out on the elephant back, there is a chauffeur, goes by the name Chandra, uh, Chen Yi, Chen Yi, Ch Chandra, Chandra. In Chinese called Chen Yi. So Chandra, and he was driving the Buddha, the Prince Siddhartha at the time. First sight he see, seen is, I think it's a sight of aging, I think, aging. He saw someone sick, yeah, Sir Nobinson. Mm -hmm. He saw someone who was sick, I think, lay on the, uh, lay on the ground and coughing. Even though the king precisely planned it, like maybe a week in advance, have a guard patrolling around. But in the sutra itself, it says that one of the Maha Brahma, which is like very high level uh, beings, they appear as a sick person in there. So no matter what you do, you just can't stop it. Because all you can do is, using scientific term, physical. But these people has be has able to find a gap between the electrons. So random, right? So, um, 
basically he can do something that human cannot. So basically he appeared in front of the Buddha and the Buddha was like, there's a sick person there. Chandra, what is this person doing? Why is he lying? Why is he not standing? He never had any idea about this. His father's precisely banning all old people, sick people, monastics to be appearing in front of him. Only young, beautiful, uh, lively, full of life people are allowed to be near him. So his life is like that, very sheltered, very cocooned. And he suddenly saw someone lying there, almost dying. He's like, what's happening, Chandra? And then Chandra's like, as a sick person, oh Chandra, if this person is sick, will I be sick too one day? And then the Chandra's like, of course, of course. You know, we have, you know, conditions in, in life where, um, you know, we might not go in well. Our body might fall in, you know, ill to some disease. And this person is falling ill to some disease. And Buddha's like, I mean, Prince Siddhartha was like, if I, um, you know, one day have fallen ill, will I be like this person? Chandra said, yes, you will. And he started to think about it when he came back. So it gets more and more intense. So after that, second thing is he went up to the to the palace gate and he saw uh, how to say he saw the Asian people, old people with white hair. So I was thinking, how old is his father? Did he dye his hair? But anyway, the point is like, isn't his father already old by the time? Maybe he's like very old and frail, like 80, 80 years old people. So he, he saw an old people using a walking stick to walk around. He asked the same question to Chandra. Hey Chandra, what is that person doing with a walking stick and why is his hair white? Everything sounds very naive and he is, mm. or he appears to be. He is. And, and, and Chandra's like, that's aging. It's like, so Chandra, will I be like him one day? And Chandra was like, yes, yes my prince, you will be like him one day. And he looked at his own body, he's like, so this body does not stay like that forever. It will frail, it will get, you know, all sorts of disease, it will get spots. The hair will not be lush forever, lush and full of hair or black color. It will be white, turning gray and then turning white. So he just realized that we do age. So he went back. And third time he went out, he saw a person lying there motionless and then lifted up by a lot of family members and then walking towards the Ganges River because he passed by the Ganges River, which is a very famous river in India, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And that, and then there were, you know, because Ganges River is holy in Indian society, uh, they, when they die, they will just put it into, inside the river, you know, as like a passage. So he's like, why is that person lying there not moving, Chandra? And then Chandra was like, he's dead, my prince, he's dead. It's like, so you're saying that one day this will not function. I will stop breathing and I will be like him. Yes, Chandra, uh, uh, yes, my prince, you will. So after this observation, he went back. Things getting worse, getting more intense for him. It's like. So I have these three conditions. Everybody has to face. I was not known until I was like fully grown adult. And he's a bit depressed in a sense, to be honest, because his worldview has been shaken, like shattered. Like, oh, so people won't stay young forever. People won't live forever. People won't, you know, have, you know, longevity. Everyone will die and will go old, will go sick. So he, he started to ponder, how do I get out of this? What happened? And so he went out again, last time, on the last gate. And this time he saw someone sitting there, very peaceful, very serene, shaved the hair, the hair is shaved, under the trees. And that moment captured him, his heart. It's like, why is that person so peaceful, so serene, Chandra? Chandra's like, He's practicing meditation. He's um, cultivating spiritual path um, to, you know, to get out of this, not get out, to improve his um, spiritual uh, awareness. 
something like that. So the Buddha was like, so that's how you do it, to get out of this condition. So he went back, he's, as you can see, no matter what his father did during his childhood, his destiny is to steer towards the monastic or steer towards the path of enlightenment. So he's like, yeah, a way. Like, this might be the way to get out of it. At the same time, he was already arranged a marriage with his wife. All right? And his wife is one of the most beautiful women in the whole realm, in the whole um, kingdom. So as the, so, uh, the, the scriptures say so. And they were married. You know, because in one of the... So why do I say that? Because his condition that time is he, he was about to be married. And obviously, he's not like the kind of person to say, I don't want to. He's like, I'm just going to follow what my father said because you're paying his kindness. And it was in this party, something like that, and everyone's like, you know, trying to... Um, it's kind of like a matchmaking kind of thing, I don't know. All I can remember is when everyone was like, oh, you know, gushing and all that, only his wife was steady, like not over the top and able to preserve her grace and like the same level as the prince. So, yeah, everyone can see that, like, you know, these two are more on the same frequency. I know, I don't know if you think, uh, like, you know, when, when, when this relationship happens, it's, it has to be somehow in the same frequency for it to work. It can't be like one side is already gushing over the other side. It's a bit of imbalance. And in Buddhism, there's a saying, to be a husband and wife, you need to have that same level of marriage and fortune. Now, uh, Fuji has the same level of marriage and fortune. Yeah, I just mentioned it myself. So, so that they, they both can share the same life in the same kind of condition. So that's what happened to them as well. It, it has to match, call it the vibe or anything. The energy has to match. And it matches. So they married, they have a child. The first thing he had saw his own child, this, during that time, he's already went to these four sites, you know, old, oldness, illness, uh, uh, sickness and death. And then his child was born at the moment. He realized that he needs to go out to be a monk. So if you look at his child and name him Rahula, because the, you know, he's the prince, so he gets to say what the name is. And Rahula in Sanskrit, do you guys know what it means? Loho Loho. Mm. You know what it means? Sufu, <laughs> Bon, Chain. Oh, Rahula. Imagine your father saw you and then he's like, yeah, you're my chain. You're chaining me to this world. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a bit like, whoa, man. Come on, how'd you call him? Like, you know, like baby or, or something sweet and nice. But there's a reason behind that. He's already like looking for a way out. And then he's like seeing that his children was born. And this child, it's a subtext. It's just saying that like, this is a bond that ties you to the world. Without put, we look at from different perspective, it is, isn't it? Like you can have all the money in the world, you can all the, you know, fame, all the cars, all the success, but it cannot be compared to having your own children born into this world. And that moment of connection is very strong. It pulls you in, and that's precisely why you're in this world as well. You pull into your parents, and you're born to them. Not born to other people, you're born to them. Of seven billion population in this world, or gazillions in the universe, you're born to them. Think of the statistics. Your connection with them is very strong. Otherwise, you will not be parent and child. And Buddhism does not say that you should not be filial and kind to parents. A lot of people misunderstand. Oh, you become a monk and so you don't care about parents. If they only read that part, they don't read the whole thing. So, such a strong tie pulls you in, makes you, you know, want to take care of it. What, whatever you do doesn't matter anymore. It's all about them, the kid. It's all about them. Are they eating well? Are they sleeping well? Are they holding themselves well? You know, are they doing, um, are, are they living okay? Everything is about them until you die. Like, they can be 80 years old, you can be 120. You will still be there at that moment thinking about, uh, is he doing well, you know? 
it never, it's a powerful thing. You can feel it because you do have parents. And, and you will be parents one day too, if you choose to be. And you will feel the same thing your parents feel towards you. So this is, in another sense, a bond that ties us to this world. Strongest one. Even beyond, I mean, maybe matched by husband and wife, but maybe even stronger than that. So, Buddha used that word to tell us it is a bond. It is what it is. You know, without putting sentimentality, it is a bond that pulls you to the world. But does not mean that you do not take care of them or anything. I will not try to justify it because Buddha's story is complete. You will see it in a whole circle. It will tell you why he did this. Why did he want to leave his family behind? Why did he want to go to a jungle? afterwards you know because you find out what is most important what really matters not that their family don't matter but can it solve the problem right that's what troubles him when he saw the four sides when he go back he think about my father will grow I will grow old. my son one day will well maybe if I have children they will grow old they will die they will fall sick and if you have seen sick elderly relative of your life, in your life, you will know it's not fun. Every day is not torment. Some of them taken care well. It's still okay, but it is like drag into this world. You know, it's like a bag that keeps, you have to keep dragging. You can't let it go. It's very heavy. And you have to do it life after life after life after life. Never ends. So, she think about it. It's impressive when you think about it, but it is like that. You know, when you grow old, you need to be taken care of. You need to worry about the health. You need to worry about the sickness. You need to worry about food. What you used to, you know, you can take care of yourself, you can wash yourself. You're no longer able to do that at the old age. You're sitting there, lying down at the mercy of people taking care of you. That's the reality of our world, our existence. And so it begs the question, if you have a chance, you know, after you naturally, you know, your lifespan ended, do you want to try again? Do you want to start again this kind of process? Just for the sake of it. I'm not talking about Bodhisattva about that's an entire different thing. That is the analogy of oil lamp burning themselves in order to inspire others. But I'm just talking about as a normal human beings. Get married, get children, have a nice, beautiful moment with them, and then old age and then die. And then you want to start over again. Do you want to start over again if you have a chance? Think about it. Don't answer me. Don't, don't have to. It's a personal question. But what Buddha showed us is, I think this circle, you know, cycle, there's a way out. And how? I have this ideal that this birth to death and old illness, maybe pleasure in some here and pain in some there, how do I get out? He does not know. So what would anyone do if you do not know? You seek. You go out and find an answer. It's a very important answer to be answered. It's a problem needs to be solved. It's not like, you know, small problems. Everyone has to face it. Everyone has to go through this. So he went. He's like, okay, let's do it. So over here, I have talked about Buddha, what he represents, the purest nature, but the reality of life, you know, he went through all the nice childhood, everything he wanted, he gets, everything he, um, everything he ever, everything everyone ever asked for, fame, power, fortune, he has. Talent as well, something that he's born with. Very good talent, smart, mathematically smart, artistically smart, martially smart at least mathematical martially so he's very smart he can be anything but uh, it's that important in the end of the day we think of that thing uh, doesn't have to be yes or no it can be different answer for different stages but what Buddha realized he's been through all that highs you know the, he, he ride the wave he reached to the top that anyone could achieve at that moment. He sit there thinking. He's, 
she's still able to have compassion heart and all that that's his characteristic but is that really important? so he went up he sees the real thing he sees the homeless people he sees people who's begging he sees someone's um, there's a scene as well someone's begging for rice they are farmers and he's like why do you have people begging for food while I and then he's like reflecting back in the life I've ever been the food I want is already prepared for me the food I like is already cooked for me I have three palaces for me to enjoy and because of our different in our position and birthright that person is begging and I'm here enjoying food it's not cute it's more like why you know why and this applies to us now it does not change same thing like I'm enjoying my you know 9 to 5 and then someone's there begging someone's there you know half a leg is gone standing there miserable and painful and someone even though they have 9 to 5 they, their mental faculty is not full like some of them might have issues finding jobs some of them have issues with the family everyone has that pain spot and this is our life not saying that it's ooh, doom and gloom we need to look at it entirely they are beautiful but it brings out perseverance it brings out compassion compassion has not come out of nowhere guys compassion has to come out from witnessing suffering being part of the suffering like you've been through this that compassion is strong especially in doctors I saw so many people correct me some of them not, not many some people might seen their own grandmother going through this painful process I saw some of them in, in, in the interview and he wants to be a doctor because he's seen the doctor is helping his grandmother passing away peacefully and he's inspired right Buddha exists everywhere those people are Buddha you can say that they can be anywhere anytime they inspire people but right now, what Shai Muri was trying to show us is wake up, this is what happened. You can still enjoy, you can still have your own pursuit, but understand the priorities, you know, what's important, what is not important. So if he showed himself as a prince who has everything, who owns everything, who has power over everything, this stage of his life, it shows us what is not important what is not as important as what comes after. So in the end of the time, even his most precious son was born. He named him Rahula, the bondage, the bond, the bond that ties me to the world, the chain, it's called the chain. You're the chain. And that also tells us that it's very precious, but it's not solving the problem. He's not that kind of person to half, half, I don't want to use that half half hearted effort so it's like no I need to find a way out not for myself only for everyone including us here that's why we're sitting here there won't be this image if we didn't do that there won't be reminder these are all reminders guys these are all your notification pop-ups but that last more than 10 years thousands of years it will still last for another at least another 1000 years Appreciate this moment, guys. You won't be here for you will be here for another nine thousand years. That's it. In the last one hundred years, four times Amitofo, and at the end of that day, it's gone. In final life sutra, that's what they say. So, back to the point. He pursued it. It's like that's it. So, what elements did he have to do this? What kind of quality did he need to have to take that step? He has gone through a beautiful life, shocked by the reality of the world. All right? So he knows what is impressing, important, and what is important but not as pressing. All right? What priorities? He knows his priorities. What other quality he needs to have in order to take that step to find a solution? Courage. Courage. It takes a lot of courage to get out that door. And your loving father, although he's a father, he's also his boss, king. And he does want him to be a prince, to continue his empire. 
But he goes against it. And then he has his wife sleeping there, his children sleeping there. They have a nice party celebrating the birth of the, the, the son of the prince, Rahula. Everyone's dead drunk, that's, a, that's according to history. And they were lying there like all sorts of... Because the father precisely says, hold the door, do not let the prince out. Because the prince had kind of a conversation with his father, like, I think I want to be a monk. And his father was like, no, 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 no. And he's like, I need to be a monk. Like, I need to find a way out. Because all I can see in this world, it does not solve this problem. I need to be a monk. I need to follow that path of... In understanding that society, this person actually... Monk is actually one of the most freest person. They can go anywhere, doing anything. They can learn. They are the most renowned people. And the father's like, if you need answers, just summon them to the court when you're a king next time. You don't have to go out there and do it yourself. He said, that's not enough. I need to know it myself. How to solve these four problems. And ask his father, I will be king. I will stay at home and be a king if you can solve three questions. First one, can you guarantee no one will die? Evergreen, you know. Can you guarantee no one will age? Can you guarantee that, you know, you will not fall in sick? Can you guarantee these three things? No death, no illness, no aging. Everyone's 18 years old. Everyone's forever uh, evergreen, 18 years old. No one's sick, everyone's healthy. Always prime condition. No, you will lose your job at the time. And then, <laughs> that's not only for dentists, that's not only for doctors. But you can do better things. Even like more creative stuff. Who knows? The last one, there's no death. Can you guarantee that, my dear father? It's like, no one in the world can guarantee that, Siddhartha. No one. And he's like, sorry, dad. That's why I wanted to be a monk. I want to solve these three problems. Everyone's in conventionally thinking like, Mate, did you drink too much or something? You know, like, what do you have last night? Um, but, you know, like hangover or something? No, it's not. So, he is very clear, he's sharp, he's smart. He do not indulge in those intoxicants. He wants that. And his father was like, sorry man, you cannot. So he locked the door and all that. So what happened is, Mahabrahma come to the rescue, Fan Chienwa. So he just come down as like, mate, like, you know, give them a sort of a spell. Everyone slept nice and sweet, but some of them have a very ugly sleeping pattern. Why did they say that? Because no matter how beautiful they put up the appearance is, it's not, like I'm just saying the, the, the reality, right? Is when, when you sleep, you snore, your, your saliva comes out, all that thing comes out, all right? What, 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 what do they try to say here? Why do they put it in the sutra? Because it shows us you know, beneath the beautiful skin and all that. It's it's a lump of flesh. All these, you know, anatomies, you know, muscles, all the bloods, all the the, the yellow color, I don't know what they call. The lynch or something. Lymph? Yeah. yeah. Lymph no. I know it's yellow color. Is it yellow color? I don't know. They show the color before. Artillery. All these and the excrements and all that. Yeah. Think about that. Beautiful bag, Gucci bag, inside they're all food trash. Basically that's what it is. If we talk about biologically. Um, so, same thing. Everyone's falling asleep and the, the demon is terrible. Like, precisely for that moment. And then the Siddhartha, Prince Siddhartha was looking at everyone. Palace guard and everyone, literally falling asleep. His own beautiful wife as well, sleeping. But the position, the look is not good because he's sleeping right so he looked at that he's like like you know all these beautiful things are superficial I want something that's actually beautiful which means real genuine true you know he has all that thing already on all the six senses pleasures the look the everything he already used to that alright the top of the quality now he, he's like this is not permanent Illness will come, sickness will come, death will come. That's it, gone. I need to find something that is genuine, that is forever there. Truth, where's the truth? So he went out through the door. Only one person was not falling asleep. Chandra, his best bro, Chandra, his um, best companion. Chandra was like, 
Oh prince, why are you out here? Your father, the king, forbids us from letting you out. Obviously, Prince Siddhartha is a very charming person and very kind. He's like, oh Chanda, I need to find out a way to solve this problem. I can't live ignorantly knowing this happens. Drunk on power, drunk on, you know, all these pleasures. I already have all that. I can't live without knowing a way out, a truth. That's how convinced he is. And he sat there and he pursued that. That's another quality he has shown us. I, I, I would uh, plead everyone to you know, take home is once we have clear awakening, like understanding, clear understanding analysis, we need to start prioritizing what is important, what is not. It might not happen in one go, one breath. It's not. It takes him 20, from age of 19 to 30 years old to get to that level of enlightenment. He's 30 years old when enlightened. He went to, when he was outside the gate, he's 19. So he's taking 11 years to get there. But you, you, he already set his sight towards that. You know, if you remember what Varengo Chanda, which is Chai Lao mentioned, doesn't, you know, um, direction is important. Goal is important. You will set your sight towards something that really matters in the long run. All right? You can do something in the middle, that's fine. But whatever you do will always go back to that point no matter what happens. That's very important. Because if you set your intention towards that path, whatever you do will always merge in there. You will always go full circle. Some people just go straight. Like some people just like, yeah, I know, I'm into four. Why do I need to think so much? And then he gone. But there's very one, two percent. Most of us, we need to worry about this. Like me, oh, I want to engage in archery. I want to engage in acting. So much distractions. But when you go through that process, then you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I want to come back. Merge back to the main goal. You have your own circle as well, and do not deny it. You need, if you need to go through that, you need to go through that. Marriage as well sometimes, your relationships, career. If you have to go through that, you have to go through that. That is your condition. And that is a fertile ground as well for you to practice. Enlightenment. Always remember, enlightenment is every part. It does not have to be you go out and become a monk. What he do is he's showing us an example of pursuing what you really need and commit to it despite what appears to be, you know, your place. You know, when it's time, the condition, the opportunity comes up, you know, they open a window opportunity, you need to go and see it for yourself. All right, so the intention is to be there, it has to be right, it, I mean, it has to be correct, you know, and the rest you need to have courage. You can't see it now, you will not able to see the result immediately. You might not even know whether you do it right or wrong. But if it's a right intention and that path is there, and you think it thoroughly, go, do it, and then see how it goes. And then see how it goes. So he went out there. He does not say, oh, I will be a Tathagata, I will be the Buddha, I will gain full enlightenment. He just wants to know how to get out of this season, this problem. He went up there, he went to the trees, talked to Chandra, Chandra was crying. He's like, oh, Prince, I'm really looking forward to you to be a king. Why do you want to be like this? I want to serve you for the rest of my life. Why do you want to do this? And he's like, sorry, Chandra, uh, Chandra I, I, this is the path I need to pursue. So he cut his back, hair off. Um, hand it to him and say, give it back to my father so that he knows that you're safe. And also tell him that I, I, I command you to drive me there. Uh, and you have no choice. Right? Not that you voluntarily bring me there. I commanded you, force you to bring me to the river. He's trying to save Chandra's life. Back to the Imperial Palace, can you imagine that? What did you do adopting my son? You know, attacking the prince to the river might be like that. All right? Don't forget about that part of the world, guys. Um, what, what I'm trying to say is the prince is thoroughly think of everything. This is my sword. Tell him everything, you know, valuable and everything. And this is my hair. I'm still alive and well. I'm just meditating in the forest. Just tell my father that. So he went back and he's like, 
Chandra was crying like crazy. He's like, why do you do this? Like, you know, you will be great king. Why do you do this? Why do you leave us? Chandra, when I find the answer, I'll come back to find you guys. He did. So he went and then become a monk while well, starting to be find a sage. That's for another day. That's the story for another day. We'll, we'll share it when I'm back from uh, Japan. Uh, so we have time, five, ten minutes. Anyone has anything else to share with my long talk? Yeah. What do you guys think about this? In terms of, um, have you guys find it? You know, do you guys have a time, like, have a moment where you have to prioritize things? Like that moment of, you know, maybe in the middle of the night, we're drinking that tea, and you're like, "What do I do with my life? What do I want to do with my life? Is that it? Have you guys had that thought before? Yeah, in there." Am I enjoying the chase? Am I still in the chase? If the chase has ended, it can be a relationship, it can be a career, it can be a dream. What's next? Have you guys had that moment when you woke up in the morning? No? Yeah? A little bit? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I always have um, a feeling of being a bit lost. Um, but I think, you know, after mm. I know about I'm talking about life, that's, it's like, I know what my goal at the end of the life is, mm. but like... Um, in between? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes mm. I feel a bit like, lost. Mm. As in like, what am I doing this for? Like, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And if I say, just turn on me to four? Yeah. 24-7? Yeah. Can you do it? No, because I have I mean, I other do. things as well. Yeah. <laughs> Not even with the other things, could you do it? Um, like, I, I, I have to be in the habit of doing it. Mm. So I'm not currently in the habit of like, you know, when I'm doing other things and then like I'll chant in my head as well. Mm. Like I always have to remind myself to do it. But mm. sometimes I don't remember to remind myself mm. to do it. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Same. Like, it's, I didn't like 100% chant. The only moment I can actually chant is actually hosting the service in the morning. It forced me to focus. But the other days, I somehow had the thought chanting, but not incessantly, not focused. But what else, like anything else guys, like other than that? I think um, most of us heard about Buddha story many times. Mm. Every time we hear about it, it's different kind of feelings and thoughts, especially this time. Mm. For me, mm. and I thought like Buddha ob- observed people like dying or really sick, and you know all these average people compared to him. He mm. lived in a very very luxurious life, very, yeah. and even mm. people like him living such a luxurious life, and he also wanted to get out and look for something evergreen or everlasting. Um, but for other people like us, we only find a res- uh, resolutions to our daily problems and things like that. But what if, like, if we have everything like Buddha or the Queen, Queens, and what will, would we do? Like, were we looking for something evergreen, everlasting? You know, that true nature, beauty thing, as we mentioned when Buddha was born. Mm. That's what the Buddha was looking for. You know. Mm. Um, so what I'm, I guess, what I'm trying to say is that even though we get everything we want in life. And these things are not lasting. Mm. So looking for something ever being everlasting, I think that's for me is ultimate goal. Mm. Um, yeah. And I like that you mentioned that one. It's not just Buddha in history who has everything, who has own power over everything, and looking for that. Think about Qing Su Wang. Think about all the kings, emperors of the other era. None of them able to do what Buddha did. Why they do? Because they also look for everything everlasting, but they went into an error zone. They think, I want to keep this body. Mm-hmm. I want to keep all my young mm-hmm. ones, mm-hmm. you know, all my servants mm-hmm. uh, in this world. And so what did he do? He eat mercury. Well, we, we might seem like this is a bit stupid, but back in the day, they look for solutions. There's so many paths that claims evergreen, everlasting. 
but there's not much of them reaching the end. Mm. The rest of them, they end up something like this, eating mercury every day, thinking they are going to reach everlasting. All right. That's also an error zone. The intention is already wrong. Right. So to, to find that path, the direction has to be correct. Like you, what you need to know to get out of this, you cannot be greedy about all that. He, Buddha knows what to let go. He needs to let go of his comfort zone. He needs to let go of all this in order to focus only on the task. Not trying to put, like trying to be king, trying to be, you know, husband to 1,000 wives, trying to have all this power and domain while keeping it as greedy. He's not. He knows this has to be go in order to find that path. He's focused. Like Master Jin Kung say, Yi Men Shen Lu Chang Shi Xun Xu. He focused on that path. He immersed himself to find out that goal. He may see a lot of teachers, but he stayed by them years, two years, three years before he leave. He don't just hop. You know, like me, I don't hop. He don't, he focused. He's like, yep, I learned all I can learn. That's not it. Let's move on. Yeah, it takes, there is a way to do it. It's not saying you can't. Even your busy life, my busy life, there's a way to do it. Yeah. You know, there's a famous t- uh, student of Confucius, his name is Yan Hui. Mm. He lived a very poor life. He can't even, like, he has a very small space. You don't even have to the cup. Sleep, and he has, like, every day he doesn't have enough food to eat. But he's had a very, very heavy life. And Confucius, he is the highest, uh, um, like, Confucius, Confucius really like that student. He's the highest student. regard. Yeah, yeah. regard student. Because even though he lived a very humble, humble life, but yeah. his spirit is that high. He's like enlightened almost. You know, he's, he's like something like real, like in the every, everlasting kind of like yeah. in real nature, Buddha nature thing. Mm. Um, so that's something I think good to see. It tastes sweeter, right? Yeah. Yeah, I hope, I hope, you know, like in this lesson we can get something that you can, you know, put yourself in perspective into. What we're trying to do here is riding on the wave the Buddha has gave us, you know, the the road. And just just have a look, you know, like just just explore a bit. Not not telling you to drop and go. Um, it's, you you won't do that. I know, uh, very rational people. But just understand, like you know, maybe maybe I can do a bit more bigger, uh, as in my path can be you know readjusted a little bit. Focus on one thing. Maybe right now I focus on my career or something, yes. But those things, 9 to 5, is not going to define my whole life. I'm not going to stuck in that my whole life. I will retire. And if I keep going like a hamster, chasing an endless wheel, instead of getting out of the wheel, I will not get anywhere. Perhaps, you know, in my way, in a way that's acceptable to me, I can incorporate what I have learned from this, on, from the teachers. You know, to, 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 to steer myself to this path, slowly, you know, but steadily. It would take forever, but it would take quite a, quite a while to get there, but you know, give yourself a chance. Maybe explore that path. You might also, in the relationship, in the family, that does not stop you from doing that. You still need to go and deal with the four problems. Death, illness, aging. And, of course, you need to take care of them, you need to be there, but you need to have that stronger sense of perspective that helps you to, in a sense, elevate your sufferings. If you take care of them and you get too attached to them, instead of understanding this is a process, they will go. And if they want to go, make sure they go in a good place. It gives you a bit more power over something that you cannot control. Why? Because you, your thoughts, intention change. Yeah, that's not, yeah. That's it. Uh, that's my summary. I hope it's a bit piecemeal. As you can see, this is where I'm thinking. Suddenly from A, jumping to C, and then going back to, to B and A. But uh, hopefully I rounded up enough for you guys to bring home. Um, and yeah, share it around. You know, share the story, Buddha, what you feel from this um, with other people. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll finish this by chanting 10 times and dedicate marriage.
阿弥陀佛，阿弥陀佛，阿弥陀佛，阿弥陀佛，阿弥陀佛，阿弥陀佛，阿弥陀佛，阿弥陀佛，阿弥。For may the merits and virtue accrue from this work, adorn the Buddha's pure land, and repay the four kinds of kindness above, and relieve the sufferings of those in the three parts below. May those who see and hear of this aspire by their understanding and compassion to dedicate their whole life in learning these teachings. Together to be born in the land of ultimate bliss. Amitabha. Two announcement. First thing, Venerable Wu Ling. Have you guys heard of Venerable Wu Ling? No, she's American nun. Uh, directly under Master Ching Kong. Learn from him. He's now in Australia, half an hour away from here. However, she is in condition where she can't sit for long, so. She still insists that she wants to give us a talk, half an hour. I don't know what's the interval. It might be one off. It might be monthly. I just want to ask, what is the perfect time for you guys? It's an online session. It won't be live. She can't move too far. Yeah. What is the perfect time for you guys to attend session from her? Is on Sunday. Not sure yet. She's not now. How long is she going to be? Um. Let's just assume. It will be a one-off, half an hour session with her. Like a Q and A, or a... I think it will be element of Q and A. Yes. Um, I think it's better if we do it like before, or after this class. Oh, as in the off week, as in we have class every two weeks in the mid in the between. Yeah, as in like, like, oh, like this time. Do it here. Yeah. Good idea. So if we do it on one of the. Sundays, would you guys be able to participate? Yeah. We've already yeah. You already arrived. Right. Like, Why not? Right. <laughs> There's no choice. I mean, watch it together. It's online. Yeah. Huh? There will be streams, so we can just yes. watch it together. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That would be good because it will include all the associations and hopefully everyone online communities. How often is she going? Very week? hard to tell because she her condition, she's still recovering. Um, she can't sit for long. That's why she, she's usually one hour, but she have to cut it down to half an hour. I hope we can have at least every two months, every month. Okay. But um, if not, even one time, that will be enough. Okay. What if I propose we do it on the sixteenth of April? Sixteenth of April. Was it Sunday? I think it's Sunday. Oh, 